Massimo Piliucci, welcome to the Inquiring Mind podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so uh, before we get into the conversation, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, what you do, and why you wrote? Uh, well, I have these two books, but I'm sure there are more on <laughs> Stoicism. Uh, I'm a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York, although my first academic career was in evolutionary biology, uh, so I have a background in science. Uh, the reason I wrote books on, uh, on Stoicism, yes, those two that you showed are, are, are a couple of examples, is uh, because um, I kind of rediscovered Stoicism as a philosophy of life uh, a number of years ago. Um, I was familiar somewhat with Stoicism when I was young. I studied uh, Seneca, one of the major Stoics, uh, in high school, actually, when I was, I was translating him, it, him from Latin. And then I read Marcus Turidus' Meditations, another major Stoic text when I was in college, but then it's like some, in a sense, it kind of went into the background and, you know, I, ne I didn't think about it until a number of years ago when I was going through my own little uh, version of a midlife crisis and I was looking for a new way of thinking about things and, you know, living, living my life. And um, of all things, I saw these, this thing that on Twitter that said, help us celebrate Stoic Week. And I said, the hell is Stoic Week? And why would anybody want to celebrate the Stoics? And, and then I remember, wait a minute, but Stoics, that's Seneca, that's Marcus Aurelius. Um, and uh, so I started looking into it and it really did change my life. Uh, I uh, all of a sudden discovered a new way of thinking about things, of making priorities in life, of uh, deciding what's important and what is not important. And uh, once I got into this in terms of, uh, you know, being a passion, a life, literally life-changing passion, then I started writing about it. And uh, here we are a few years later uh, with, you know, two or three books <laughs> under my belly. But what was the exact kind of path and why Stoicism in particular, not some other uh, philosophy, for example, Epicureanism or, or, or a major religion? What, what, what's, right. what about Stoicism in particular? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I grew up in a, within a religion. I grew up Catholic in, in Italy, uh, but I left the religion when I was in uh, you know, high school uh, because it just, it, lots of things didn't make any sense. I mean, when, when I was having discussions with my priest, it's like uh, I was asking questions and he was answering in ways that, is, that were definitely not satisfactory. Um, so after that, I always considered myself a secular humanist, which is a type of philosophy of life. The problem is that when it, the mid-crisis started, mid-life crisis started, which was triggered by a couple of major events, like, you know, an unexpected divorce and my father dying, for instance, as well as actually a change of career, moving to another city, uh, you know, different job and all that sort of stuff. Now, any psychologist would tell you that one of those things is sufficient to uh, trigger a significant degree of, of uh, stress when they four or five happen at the same time, like in, in the span of a few months, then it's like, whoa, uh, it makes you think. And so I reached naturally for uh, psychohumanism. I said, okay, that's, this is my philosophy of life. So, so what would a psychohumanist do under those, those conditions? And uh, I didn't really get much of an answer because as it turns out, Although secular humanism is still, for me, an interesting point of reference in terms of general ideas, you know, it's a support for human rights and use of reason and, you know, uh, science-based uh, uh, way of, of deciding what to do in life and so on and so forth. It is actually, doesn't actually give you a lot of specifics. It's like, okay, th that, those are great ideas, but what am I supposed to do right now about the fact that my father died or about the fact that, you know, my wife filed for a divorce? So... That's when I actually started looking systematically at other possibilities. And I did explore uh, several other uh, philosophies of life, beginning with Buddhism, because it's a fairly popular one, because several of my friends told me, you know, you should look into, into Buddhism. And I found, I found the Buddhism ethics very interesting and, and sort of like I could relate to it. It was actually useful. Uh, Buddhist techniques like such as meditation, you know, different kinds of meditation are actually helpful. However, I couldn't wrap my mind around Buddhist metaphysics. So, you know, I'm a scientist. If you ask me to believe in things like karma and reincarnation and things like that, I said, no, sorry, that's, I'm, I'm not going there. Then I looked into some of the Greek Roman philosophies because those are known to be uh, the most practically oriented of uh, uh, philosophies in the Western tradition. 
And so I did look at Aristotle, I did look at Epicurus, but for one reason or another, none of them grabbed me. You know, Aristotle is a little bit of too much of a uh, elitist in a sense or aristocrat, because he tells you that a good life, a flourishing life is one in which, yeah, you, you work on your character, uh, you know, you, you try to be virtuous, so, so to speak, but then also you have to have a bit of money, a bit of education, uh, you know, health and good luck and you know, good looks. It's like, oh, come on, that's, that's way too many things uh, uh, to ask for a person in order to, to live a, a life worth living. The Epicureans were probably the most interesting ones aside from the Stoics for a number of reasons. The Epicureans, uh, Epicurean metaphysics is pretty science friendly. Uh, you know, they were atomists, so they believed that uh, the world is made of atoms, you know, small particles bumping into each other and, and making bigger things. Now, of course, the details of that metaphysics are not accurate, but the general outlook is actually fairly easy to reconcile with modern science. So that's a point in favor of the Epicureans. They also had an, uh, put a lot of emphasis on friendship, which strikes me as a, as a good idea. Uh, they also didn't really believe in superstition. They rejected, they, for instance, Epicurus says, you know, don't, don't be afraid about being dying because when death is here, you are not, you're not, and vice versa. Uh, you know, you're not conscious when, when you're dead. So there's nothing to be afraid of. And in fact, it's kind of priests and poets that make up all these stories about the afterlife just to scare the shit out of you. And so it's like, okay, well, all this sounds good. However, the problem with Epicureanism, as far as I'm concerned, is that the goal of an Epicurean is a life that they describe as ataraxia. Ataraxia is a Greek word that means lack of disturbance. You, you want to go through life serene, you know, without, without experiencing, especially mental discomfort, mental pain. In fact, Epicurus defined the highest possible pleasure as lack of pain. But then he tells you that in order to get there, you need to stay away as much as possible from social and political involvement, because as we all know, social and political involvement is in fact painful. And I thought, well, you almost had me, but, but no, I don't think I, I don't think a life, a human life really has to, to involve social and political components because human beings are fundamentally social animals. And if by politics, we mean not necessarily paying attention to what Democrats and Republicans are saying, but being involved in the police, in the in the community, and you know, and do things, you know, try to do things in order to improve the community. Then, then, if a philosophy tells me that that's something that I need to avoid, then that philosophy is not for me. So Stoicism in, in, ended up being the one that actually fits all all of the major desiderata, because on the one hand, with one big exception that might we might get to talk about. Later, uh, Stoic metaphysics is uh, friendly to modern science. The Stoics were materialists, meaning that they thought that anything that has causal powers in the world is made of matter, it's made of stuff. That goes well with, fundament, with, you know, with modern physics. Uh, they were determinists in the specific sense that they thought that everything happens as a result of cause and effect. No miracles. Uh, you, know, no, you, you cannot suspend the laws of nature, essentially. So that also goes pretty well. Uh, they didn't believe, you know, in a, in a afterlife, they didn't believe in all sorts of stuff. So from a metaphysical perspective, by and large, the Stoics, Stoicism worked well, but more importantly, it works well in terms of the, their ethics. They, first of all, they also had an emphasis on good reasoning. Uh, you know, they thought that in order to live a good life, you have to be able to reason well, you have to train yourself in logic, basically, basic logic. Now, you know, nothing, nothing too complicated, but you have to train yourself. That also kind of resonated with me. But more importantly, the ethics. Uh, for the Stoics, a, a life worth living is a life of virtue, which means uh, express, you know, uh, uh, exercising good judgment and trying to be helpful to people, essentially. And they derived that from the notion that, um, uh, the, the fundamental aspects of a human life, the things that differentiate us from most other animals are the fact that we're capable of reason and the fact that we are social animals, you know, uh, naturally uh, prone to cooperate. And so they thought that a good human life is one in which you apply reason to improve social problems, the so social issues. And that struck me as fundamentally right. Uh, one of the consequences, one of the corollaries of the Stoic view is that they were cosmopolitan 
uh, they, which literally means citizens of the world, right? So uh, they thought that everybody else on earth is our brother and sister and that we should treat them accordingly. And that goes, I think, very well with, uh, with the kind of inclination that I had in the first place. So, so stoicism kind of worked on, on, many, on many levels. But more importantly, what happened was that, you know, I mentioned Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, but the stoic that really turned me to stoicism was Epictetus. Epictetus was an early second century, late first century, early second century stoic philosopher teacher. He had a in really interesting life. He started out as a, as a slave in uh, uh, Hierapolis, which is in modern Western Turkey. He was brought to Rome at the court of the Emperor Nero. Uh, apparently he was a brilliant guy. So he started uh, studying, he was allowed to study philosophy with Musonius Rufus, who was uh, the most prominent uh, first century Roman Stoic. And then he was freed by his master, which was not unusual for uh, particularly talented uh, slaves. And he started teaching on his own. Uh, eventually, it, he, he got on the nerves of uh, a later emperor, Domitian, because he, like a lot of the Stoics, he had this notion of, you know, speaking truth to power, as we would say today. And emperors tend to be annoyed when you do that sort of stuff. So he was sent into exile in uh, Nicopolis in uh, northwestern Greece. There he reestablished his school, and that school became the most famous, uh, prominent school of the second, early second century. A later emperor, Adrian, became a friend, or at least came to visit several times. So Epictetus has a very interesting uh, life story, but most importantly, he spoke to me. So when I started the, the, one of the two books that we have from Epictetus, the Discourses, uh, which is uh, four volumes uh, that recount basically Epictetus' discussions with his students. You know, as soon as I started out, I say, wow, who the, who the hell is this guy? And why, why did I never hear uh, about him before? Even though I have a PhD in philosophy, I never heard of Epictetus before turning to Stoicism. Uh, he has a very straightforward way of talking. He's no nonsense. Uh, he doesn't mince words. He has a uh, delightful sense of humor that kind of borderlines on sarcasm. And so that kind of spoke to me. Uh, and uh, as soon as I started reading him, I said, okay, this, this, is, the, this is the guy. Yeah, and before we get it, obviously, you gave a very good overview of uh, Stoicism just now and, and in your books. But before we get into some of the, I think, some of the ideas in Stoicism, Stoicism that appeal to me and what I find very useful in Stoicism, um, you mentioned in uh, How to Be a Stoic that um, I think it was, I can't, I can't remember who, but somebody ended up in, I think it was Rome or somewhere, or Greece, Greece, I'm sorry, and uh, walks into a bookstore. Yes. Uh, was that Epictetus? Or no, that's story? the story of uh, Zeno of Zeno. Citium, who actually was the founder of Stoicism. And we're talking about around the, the year 300 BCE or thereabout, or 310 BCE, so the end of the fourth century uh, before the modern era. And Zeno was a merchant, he was a Phoenician merchant, and he had gone through a shipwreck where he lost everything. He survived the shipwreck and he made it to Athens. And of course, if you survive the shipwreck, what is the first thing you do? You go into a bookstore, naturally. And uh, so he went to a bookstore and he heard apparently the, uh, the bookseller reading out loud the memorabilia, which is a, a book by Xenophon uh, about the life of Socrates. And Zeno was so taken by the memorabilia that he asked the bookseller, he's like, where can I find me one of these people, meaning a philosopher? And uh, Athens being what it was at the time, the bookseller just pointed out in the streets and said, there he goes, there's one walking by right, right now. The guy walking by at the time uh, turned out to be Cratus of Thebes, who was a cynic philosopher. And uh, Zeno followed. In fact, Credis became one of his students uh, and he studied with uh, Credis for a while. Then he studied with several other of the prominent philosophers in Athens until about 10 years later or thereabout. He thought that he had uh, enough of a sort of coherent view of philosophy that he could start teaching on his own. And he chose, you know, most of the philosophers at the time were teaching outside of the city in places where you had to get on purpose to, 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 to be there specifically to do philosophy, like Plato's Academy uh, is right outside of, uh, you can still see the remnants today actually, uh, but it's right outside of Athens. Um, uh, Aristotle's Lyceum also right outside of Athens, Epicurus Garden also right outside of Athens. 
But the Stoics decided, and Zeno decided to teach in uh, right off, uh, off the main market. The Agora was the main market in Athens where everything was happening basically during the day. Right off the Agora, there was a, a set of, a series of columns, a columnate, a covered, a covered porch. Uh, and uh, the, the, the word for porch in, in uh, uh, Greek is stoa. And that's why the philosophy is called Stoicism, because Zeno started teaching in the Stoa. And it's very symbolic, because that means that uh, Aristotle, Plato, Epicurus were a little bit of an elitist. They, you, you had to have a horseback or, have, or, or, or to get into their schools or, or be willing to do a hell of a lot of uh, walking before getting there. So only certain people can be admitted. On the other hand, the Stoics were just like the cynics that preceded them. They were right in the middle of everything. They were talking to everybody who wanted to uh, learn philosophy. Yeah, well, what I loved about that story is the fact that you can, at, at the time in Greece, you could just find philosophers anywhere in the street. Right. Uh, was that part of the reasoning behind, uh, I understand you have a philosopher club meetup uh, in New yes. York City. Was that the reasoning behind founding something like that? Yes, actually, I founded that, that meetup group um, way before I actually got into Stoicism in the first place. Mm -hmm. But the motivation was very similar. It was like, we need to bring philosophy. You know, I'm an academic philosopher. And if I wanted to, I could spend my entire life just among my academic colleagues, teaching my students on campus, uh, writing technical papers that are read by, you know, a few dozen people, uh, because most, of, most others wouldn't either care or understand them. Uh, and that would be fine. Uh, lots of modern uh, academics do that, have that kind of life, not just in philosophy, in any other field, science, uh, you know, history, uh, literature, etc. But I thought it was important to get out and talk to the general public to bring philosophy to the public. Um, because it's interesting, because it's important, and because it can change people's lives. So I started doing that before I actually got into Stoicism, but def definitely after I got into Stoicism, it's been, it's been much more uh, a part of a major, sort of major part of, of my projects. It's been to keep going. Of course, now we're in the middle of a pandemic, so we do our meetups online uh, via Zoom. But uh, as soon as this thing is over, or at least it gets to a semblance of normality, I, I'm planning on resuming the, the in-person uh, conversations. Where do you usually meet up with your I try different places. There are there are some places actually in New York, uh, New York City. There are some open spaces that are accessible to everybody, and one of them actually has columns. Uh, <laughs> so it kind of looks like the store. It's down uh, near Wall Street. In fact, it's on Wall Street. Uh, it's called the Wall Street Atrium, and it's a it's a public place. So sometimes we go there, uh, and other times we go to the Society for Ethical Culture. Uh, Society for the Ethical Culture is a national, actually international, um, organization that uh, tries to help people sort of live a more ethical life. And they, I have friends there and they invited me to do some of these uh, philosophy discussions there. Great. It's open to the public, so it's yeah. anybody can come. And uh, before, when we started talking about what, what got you into Stoicism, uh, you said that uh, originally you were, you were born Catholic and Catholicism kind of didn't sit well with you. What about Catholicism uh, kind of turned you off to the religion? Uh, well, for one thing, it is a religion, so it tends to be fairly rigid. Uh, you know, you cannot argue against Jesus or, or against God. It's like, you know, that's it. The scripture, you don't argue. On the other hand, let's say a philosophy like Stoicism, as much as I love Epictetus, I argue with Epictetus. There's a chapter in uh, uh, How to Be a Stoic where I actually take up one of Epictetus's notions that I don't think work well today. I, I think he was wrong about, and that is uh, uh, his conception of the cosmos understood as a living organism. I, I don't think that stands up to scrutiny. And so I actually have this imaginary conversation with Epictetus. So one of the differences between religions and philosophies of life is that uh, philosophies of lives are based, are, uh, are based on the teachings and the writings of human beings. And so you're more than welcome to disagree with them and nobody's going to excommunicate you nobody's going to send you to hell you know things like that but the other thing is, that didn't really sit well with me was again the metaphysics underlying christianity so for instance i still remember having this conversation with my priest and uh, and asking him about uh, the transubstantiation which is this notion in catholicism that when you take communion in, in church and you're eating the wafer and drinking the, the wine, by the way, in, in Italy is real wine, not, not like in the United States and in several places where you actually drink 
drink uh, grape juice. It's mm -hmm. actual wine. And um, now the notion is that you are literally, not metaphorically, but literally mm -hmm. drinking the blood of, of Christ and eating his flesh, which first of all, it's kind of disgusting. And second of all, it's like, what do you mean, literally? It tastes like wine, not blood. And it tastes like a, a wafer, not, uh, not like human flesh. So what are you talking about here? And my priest insisted that, no, no, this is, you know, you have to accept this by faith. And I said, I don't accept things like by faith. They have to make sense uh, from a rational, empirical perspective. And so that was one of the several things that really didn't sit well with me. Another one was the Trinity, the notion of the Trinity. It's like, well, make up your mind, my friend. Is it one or is it three? Um, and they said, well, it's one and three. It's like, no, that actually violates Aristotelian logic. That, that, vi that violates the principle of non-contradiction. And I'm sorry, but even God has to stick with the principle of non-contradiction. So all those kind of things were not, uh, were, were not really uh, good for me. And so I said, okay, maybe I should find another way. Yeah, and uh, the other side of it is uh, you also outlined in your book that you didn't find much... Uh, I'm not going to say use for, but the, the, the radical atheists, as they're called. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was younger, there was the, the four horsemen, right? They, that's Correct. what they called them. I think it was uh, Dennett, Hitchens, uh, Harris, and Dawkins, Dawkins yeah, right? right? So what about those, what about that side that didn't appeal to you? So I am an atheist uh, in a sense, meaning I, I actually use the word atheist. I, I mean the word atheist in the literal etymological sense, atheist. Atheist means that I don't have a positive belief in God. It doesn't mean that I know that there is no God because that's impossible, okay? You cannot possibly know that a universal doesn't exist. You cannot make a, a negative universal statement. Uh, you, I cannot prove a negative, a universal negative. So, so if somebody tells you that they're atheist, meaning that they know that there is no God, they're just like fooling themselves. There's no such thing. But I don't have any positive belief in God. Why not? Well, because I don't think that there is evidence or reason to believe in God. And I tried, like David Hume, a famous skeptic philosopher of the 18th century, I tried to proportion my belief as much as possible my beliefs to the evidence. So uh, I think the default position is not to believe in something unless there is evidence, like I am an atheist in the same sense in which I am a unicornist. I don't think that there are unicorns out there. Now, is that because it's impossible that there are unicorns? Of course not. It's perfectly possible. Uh, are there unicorns out there? Or maybe, but I'm not going to believe that unless I see good reason and good evidence, uh, you know, in, 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 that, in that respect. Now, the thing that annoys me about the so-called new atheists and some more than others, I think that Dawkins and, uh, and Harris, for instance, are more annoying uh, than, than Dennett. Dennett is a little bit more sophisticated and he's a philosopher. And he makes a little bit more sophisticated arguments. The arguments that uh, Dawkins makes in The God Delusion, for instance, are would not pass master with a first year philosophy student. I mean, he would, he would poke holes one after another in those arguments. So, but that's not the thing that annoys me. The thing that annoys me is the in your face attitude which to me kind of is, is specular. It's kind of a mirror image of the, of the same thing that you get from religious fundamentalists, right? You can be a religious person and be definitely not in your face. I know plenty of religious people who are, you know, they, they believe what they believe. And if you want to talk to them about it, they are happy to talk about it, but that's it. Uh, they will still, you know, be your friends, even though you're not religious, they're, they're not going to try to convert you or anything like that. And then there is the fundamentalist evangelical people who are all the time in your face, who tell you that you're, you're going to hell, that you're, you're you know, missing a major thing, etc. And so to me, the new atheists are the evangelical counterpoint of the, uh, of the, uh, within the, the atheist movement. And I see, I don't like evangelical evangel evangelism in religion. I don't like it in any other thing. Uh, so I'm perfectly happy to be uh, an atheist and to explain to people why I am and in what sense I am an atheist if they ask, but I don't go around belittling people. I don't go around saying, uh, you know, silly things like religion is the, the root of all evils. No, it isn't. Manifestly, it isn't. There's certainly historically a number of things that religions have, that religious people have done that are really horrible. No question about it. Uh, you know, the crusades come to mind. Uh, but there are also plenty of things that uh, secular people have done that are horrible. You know, Stalin and Mao come to, 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 to mind. Of course, if you point that out to Dawkins, he will tell you that they were not real atheists. But that's 
come on. <laughs> then the, the, the same defense is open to Christians. They would say, oh, well, the, those were not real Christians. The ones that, then, then, then you not go anywhere. So we should uh, actually acknowledge that religions, in effect, any kind of ideology, political, religious, or, what, or even philosophical ideology is complicated. Uh, sometimes they do, people do good things uh, based on that, on that ideology, and sometimes they don't do good things. You know, there are very, very few ideologies that I think are inherently pernicious. Fascism is inherently pernicious. I cannot imagine a good fascist, okay? But I can imagine a good atheist and a bad atheist very easily. In fact, I know, I know several of them. And I can imagine a good Christian and a bad Christian. And again, I know several of them. So, um, so to me, to, to, there's no, no, need, no need to go to that kind of, uh, you know, in your face uh, grading attitude that, that the new atheists are so famous for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I was really into this debate, I guess, when I just started getting into philosophy and all that. I used to watch videos of Hitchens and arguing with these uh, religious people. It's entertaining. But sure. I think there, oh, yeah. there, come, there, there comes a point where you go, what is this for? And is there a purpose behind this? Uh, do you think that there is uh, any use to uh, the debates between atheists and religious people? Not really. I used to. Uh, when I was uh, younger, you know, early on in my career, actually, I lived um, for nine years, I, I was a professor of evolutionary biology in Tennessee. And it kind of inevitably, I ended up debating a number of creationists and theists because they would come to campus literally, uh, you know, asking for somebody to debate them. And uh, at some point, I said, sure, I'll do it. And yet, as you said, they are entertainment. They're entertaining, uh, you know, if they're well done. I mean, they can be also be very boring. But uh, if, the, if the two people are, you know, are good at that sort of stuff, they can be entertaining. They're rarely informative because uh, the two sides already know what they believe and they're going to stay there. I mean, I, I don't think anybody was ever persuaded, you know, any, any fundamentalist Christian was ever persuaded by my arguments and vice versa. I don't think any atheist was ever persuaded by the arguments of my opponents. They do serve some purpose because largely in rallying your own troops. So it's, it's a way of, you know, getting people excited about, uh, about uh, what they believe in about certain, but I, by and large, I don't think that's a good way of, that's a good uh, way to proceed in, uh, in um, public dialogue. It's also not a particularly good use of your time. So now conversations are different. Uh, if you have a conversation that includes, let's say a panel discussion that includes uh, you know, a range of positions, including an atheist, let's say an agnostic, uh, you know, a couple of different types of believers. Um, that could be interesting um, if it is well done, if it is well moderated, uh, so that people stay within, uh, you know, reasonable limits, don't insult each other and that sort of stuff. But even that, I think, has limited value. I mean, the most interesting thing you can do if you are either a religious person or an atheist uh, is just to read. Uh, you know, about certain things or go to lectures, you know, so, or different from, from different people with different persuasions and then make up your mind. Uh, debates by themselves. It sounds like a good idea initially and then it's like, no, it's a waste of time. I think the, the, the another problem I, I commonly found with the atheists is the fact that they never, they never gave an alternative so people believe in God, and for some people, that's a good thing. It's a, it's a course to follow. It keeps them to be, you know, it's, a, it's an incentive to be a good human being in some ways. Correct. And it gives them, yeah, a way to live life. A lot of atheists, I heard Sam Harris once say, well, I have no alternative. It's just I don't like religion. Right. Well, fair enough, but um, you have to at least – provide some sort of alternative, I think, in, in arguments like that. Yeah. Um, no, I and agree. I, and that, what's I, missing there, it's a philosophy of life. Right. Atheism is not a philosophy. Uh, atheism is, is a negative ontological statement or metaphysical statement, right? It's simply the statement that I don't think that this thing that you think exists actually exists. That's mm -hmm. it. And it, it entails nothing else. There is no particular political position that is related to atheism. There is no particular social, social position that is related to atheism. There is no particular ethical position that is related to atheism. You can be an atheist and be anything else as far as ethics, politics, and, uh, and social issues are concerned. That is why atheism by itself is pretty sterile. It doesn't do anything. You need a philosophy. Now, secular humanism is a philosophy uh, 
that although in my case, it turned out to be a limited use, it still is a philosophy. And it does include a disbelief in supernatural beings, because of course, uh, psychohumanism assumes that you should, that it's rational to believe only things for which there is evidence and, and reason. So, so psychohumanists tend to be agnostic or atheists, but psychohumanism is an actual philosophy. It is an alternative to religion. Stoicism is an alternative to religion because it is a philosophy that has some positive things to put forth in terms of ethics. But atheism by itself, it says nothing. It says, it says only that, okay, I don't believe in God. Great, good for you. Now what? Yeah, so let's, let's just dive in a little bit. And uh, can you explain to people the four uh, princ common, you know, the principles of Stoicism? I think there are four, right? Yes. And um, why, wh why people should be Stoics? Yeah. So the, the four, you're talking about the four cardinal, so-called uh, four, four cardinal virtues. Um, first of all, let's back up for a second. And the, the word virtue is a little weird. Uh, although that is what the Stoics talk about. It's weird because we have 2,000 years of Christianity, and so we tend to think of virtue as in the Christian way. So we tend, when, we, when we hear, most of us, when, when they hear the word virtue, we think of, about things like uh, you know, chastity and purity and you know, things like that. But that's not what we're talking about. Virtue actually comes from the Greek arete, which just means excellence. So what the Stoics are trying to do basically is to become the best human beings that they can, they can be, and particularly in the ethical realm. You can be uh, the best in, in a number of different applications, right? You can be uh, the best writer. You can try to be the best writer you can be, or you can try to be the best football player you can be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in fact, the concept of arete applies also to inanimate objects. One can, can have the best knife, you know, a, a, an excellent light knife. It's a knife that cuts really well and does its job, right? Uh, but in, the terms, in terms of ethics, of course, we're talking about an arete, you know, a virtuous person is somebody who is the best human being that you could possibly be from an ethical perspective. That is the goal of stoicism, to make you into the best human being you can be. The four cardinal virtues are, in that sense, four kind of uh, reference points that you want to keep in mind throughout your life. And every time you do something big or small, you want to ask yourself if what you're about to do is in line with the four cardinal virtues. The four cardinal virtues are practical wisdom, which is the knowledge of what is truly good for you or not good for you. Not what other people tell you is good for you, not what society tells you that's good for you, but what is really good for you. And I'll get to that in a moment, what it is. Uh, the second virtue is courage. Not in the sense of uh, necessarily bravery and physical courage, you know, going to battle and you know, that sort of stuff, but moral courage, the courage to do the right thing. The third virtue is justice, which is understood by the Stoics as treating other people with fairness and respect because they're human beings, they're fellow human beings. And then the fourth one is temperance, doing things in the right measure, neither too much nor too little, uh, which includes also self-control. The first virtue, it's interesting because it's the most difficult to explain. Uh, practical wisdom is, as I said, the knowledge of what is truly good for you and what is not good for you. And basically for the Stoics, this really boils down to only one thing. The only thing that is truly good for you is good judgment. And the only thing that is truly bad for you is bad judgment. Now, why would you say that? Well, because everything else you do is a result of your judgment, right? So whenever you choose a career, you're making judgments. Uh, whenever you decide whether to invest money or not, you're making judgments. Uh, when you decide to get married or not, you're making judgments. When you decide to have children or not, you make judgments and so on and so forth. E everything you do in your life is a result of your judgments. So having good judgment is the, the only thing that is truly good for you. The other things are truly only instrumentally. They're only tr they're good only instrumentally. Meaning, for instance, let's take money. Most people think that money is good. Yeah, I like to, I'd rather have money than not have money, right? But is that really the case? Well, that depends on your judgment. If you're, if you're using money badly, you might be better off without it. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, for instance, making money and then you're using that money to corrupt the political process to your advantage, then actually money is a bad thing. It's not good. Society at large would be, would be better off if you didn't have the money. Uh, because you're using it for nefarious, uh, uh, you know, objectives. Uh, so, so anything you have, relationships, money, career, etc., becomes good if you use it well, 
and it becomes bad if you don't use it well. And what determines whether you're using it well or not, your judgment. So that's why, according to the Stoics, the, the, the only thing that's truly good for you is good judgment. Now, how does that work in practice? Let's say that I walk tomorrow into my office, uh, you know, assuming the pandemic is over all of a sudden, uh, and I witness a scene where my boss is harassing one of my coworkers. Then the question is, should I intervene or not? You know, should I say something or not? So I consult my four virtues. The first one is practical wisdom. Is this good for me or not? It is, because it's good judgment. It's an ex exercise in good judgment to say, yes, I want to be helpful to other people. So the first virtue says, yes, you should. Courage. Does it take courage? Well, yes, it does, because it's my boss. Uh, I could you know, be fired as a result, or at the very least, uh, I, as he could go through some kind of retaliation against me because I speak, if I speak up. So yes, it takes courage. Is it just? Well, it certainly is fair to my coworker because if I were the one being harassed, I would like somebody else to come in, step in, and you know, on my behalf. So it's fair. Um, so therefore, it, it is also just. Now, what about temperance? Temperance means that I have to intervene in the right measure. So I don't want to do too little. I don't want to just mumble something under my breath so that my boss doesn't hear me. And I, you know, technically I said something, but in fact, I didn't do anything because my boss didn't hear me. That's too little. I also, however, don't want to jump into the situation and start punching him on the nose because that would be too much. That's, you know, the situation doesn't require, there's no physical danger to anybody. So it doesn't require that kind of response. So temperance would tell me to do it in the proper fashion, to, to, to speak out clearly, but not using uh, violence. So that is pretty much how a stoic goes through his or her life. Everything you do from the minor things to the, to the big ones, you always ask yourself, is this in alignment with the four virtues? You basically use the, the they're called cardinal virtues for an interesting reason, right? I mean, they kind of look like, they, they kind of function like cardinal points, like a reference, you know, that orient yourself in life, like just like a compass. Uh, tell you what to do, where to go and where not to go. Uh, the, the four cardinal virtues tell you what to do and what not to do. Right. And with the current, you know, uh, situation with the pandemic, do you think, um, obviously, you know, that it was necessary to have maybe some lockdowns and people to stay in ho at home rather than go outside mm -hmm. or whatnot at the beginning. But it's been uh, over a year now that we've been in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. A lot of people stayed home, uh, kind of went a little nuts, and uh, which is all understandable. Do you think stoicism could help? Uh, could have helped people in those kind of situations or not? Yeah, uh, stoicism I think is helpful in pretty much any situation, whether they're positive or negative, because again, it's a a way to. It's a framework uh, uh, that that organizes your life and your life decisions. So yes, being in a in a lockdown in a pandemic or partial lockdown in a in a pandemic, it's definitely one situation where you want to say, "So, what do the Stoics say about this thing?" Right? The Stoics actually some of, some of the Stoics themselves went through a similar situation. They they went through a plague, like. Um, Marcus Aurelius experienced the so-called Antonine Plague during the Roman Empire, which killed two, two or three million people. Uh, it, uh, it was the most awful plague of antiquity. Socrates, who was not a Stoic, but the Stoics were actually directly inspired by Socrates, he survived the plague in Athens during the Peloponnesian War. So plagues have been all around for a long time. You know, it's, this is not something that we're, nothing particularly new that we're experiencing. This one is on a global scale, but people have experienced these kind of things uh, uh, before. So what would a Stoic do? Well, one of the principles, the basic principles of Stoicism is the uh, dichotomy of control. The, the dichotomy of control essentially says that some things are up to us and other things are not up to us. And that a good life is one in which you focus your attention on the things that are up to us, where your agency is maximized, and you develop an attitude of equanimity and acceptance toward the things that are not under your control, they're not up to you. Now, this is a concept that it's found in Stoicism, but it's also found in a number of other traditions. One example is uh, modern Christianity. So you may have heard of the serenity prayer. 
The Serenity Prayer is a modern Christian prayer. It was written at the beginning of the 20th century, which is read often at the beginning of meetings of um, 12-step organizations like Alcoholic Anonymous and things like that. And basically, the Serenity Prayer asks God to give you the courage to tell the difference, uh, sorry, the wisdom to tell the difference between what you can change and what you cannot change, the courage to change what you can, and the serenity to accept what you cannot. It's essentially the same thing as, as the stoic economy of control. Now, how does that apply in a pandemic? Well, uh, as soon as we started you know, getting hit by the by news of the virus and uh, the, the initial restrictions, et cetera, et cetera, the first thought for me was, okay, so what can I do and what can I not do? Well, one thing that I cannot do is to make the pandemic go away. Uh, so engaging in wishful thinking, it's useless. In fact, it's, it's actually a bad idea because then you start feeling bad about the situation because you're frustrated. Uh, you know, you, you, cannot, you cannot actually, you know, use a magic wand and make it and make the whole thing go away. So the first stage, the first thing that the, the, the economic control there tells you is acceptance. You are in a pandemic. And the first you, the, the, the earliest you realize that, the better, because then your mind starts uh, organizing things in a different, in a different fashion, because you're now say to yourself, okay, now I'm living in a different situation. So it's useless to regret the past. For instance, the Stoics would say, Regret is not a stoic value because the past is outside of your control. It's gone. You cannot change it. So to go with your mind toward things like, oh, I used to go to the movies. Wasn't that a nice thing? Well, it may be a nice thing, may have been a nice thing, but you can't do it right now. So out of your mind it goes because every time you think about that, you simply are making yourself feeling worse. Now, what can you do instead? Well, um, streaming services on television are pretty good. And you know they're getting better and better. So do some research on you know good stuff that you can you can stream. Maybe even if you can afford it, upgrade your television set uh, accordingly because you're going to be there for a long time, and you have to reorient your your way of doing things. Can you work remotely? If the answer is yes, well then get organized and and start doing things. You know, uh, in, in in my case, of course, it was it, it happened very quickly. Uh, City College went from in-person teaching to online teaching within a span of a, of a week. And all of a sudden, I had to reorganize things, you reinvent myself. My syllabus was all of, uh, different in my classes because now it's a different medium. Uh, so I had to scramble to, to do things differently. I had to familiarize myself with platforms like, such as Zoom. Uh, and, and initially, it feels like, you know, constricted and it feels like artificial, etc. But then you start getting used to it. Uh, and, uh, and you start finding the advantages of this kind of thing. Like, for instance, we were talking earlier on about my meetups uh, in New York, right? My philosophy meetups in New York. Well, I used to do them only in person, which means that I, I could only reach people that were living in New York. Since the pandemic, I've been doing it on, online, which means that I literally reach people from all over the world. I mean, there have been people participating to my philosophy discussions coming from Europe, from Australia, from you know, Brazil, it's like, oh, that's great. So this is actually even better than I was doing that what I was doing before. So what a stoic would say basically is like, look, you need to accept the new situation uh, because that is part of the kind, the kind of things you cannot do anything about. You cannot avoid it. And then uh, use that as a challenge. Instead of seeing it as a setback, use it as a challenge to try to figure out creative new ways to actually still live a decent life. Uh, don't, don't indulge in regret of what you lost or what you might have been doing or what you could have happened because that's useless. That's just man, making you feel, uh, yourself feeling bad. Focus instead on where your agency actually is because people feel better when they are in control of things, when they actually are active about things. By the way, this is a trick, uh, this, this notion of... Uh, changing your point of view and, and considering, um, instead of, of thinking about things as a setback, think, thinking of them as a, ch as a challenge to be overcome. This is actually a trick that has been rediscovered by modern psychology. It's called the framing effect. And it's pretty well documented empirically. So uh, the classic example of the framing effect is if you go to the, to the doctor, let's say, and the doctor says, um, uh, all right, Stanley, I, uh, I looked at your tests and you know there is a 90 percent chance you're gonna you're gonna make it you're gonna be okay okay or imagine the same scene and you walk into the doctor's office and the doctor says you know there's a 10 percent chance you're gonna die mm -hmm. now 
the doctor is giving you exactly the same information. 90% survival or 10% death rate is exactly the same thing, right? The one, the, 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 the complement of the other, but you're going to feel very differently uh, whether the doctor puts in terms of survival or in terms of, uh, uh, of you know, probability of death. So the same goes for pretty much everything else in life. If instead of focusing on the negatives, on the, on the setbacks, you, you focus on the notion that this is a challenge that the universe has thrown your way. And now let's see, you know, let's see how we're doing. By the way, this is not to be confused with positive thinking. Uh, you know, and I'm not suggesting people should be optimistic about things because some, some things there's nothing to be optimistic about. Uh, you know, it's, it's a dire situation and that, the, the fact that you're going to think about it positively doesn't make it any better. In fact, you're kind of fooling yourself if you think of it positively. That's why I'm using the word challenge and not positive, right? Positive thinking is, is yet another thing, is yet another example of wishful thinking. It's not, it's not good for you. It's not going to be helpful in the long run. You may feel better in the moment, but in the long run, it's not going to be helpful. On the other hand, seeing things as a challenge rather than a setback, that is helpful. There, there's a plenty of empirical evidence that that actually does work. Right. And uh, again, one of the things Stoics really valued in um, as something, again, you talk about in your book, is the importance of heroes, something that clearly, that, that really appealed to me, but also... I think society at large, but I'm not going to talk about Europe or the rest of the world, but in the United States, I feel like we we're going through a uh, kind of, we have a hero deficiency <laughs> in some ways because we're arguing over who our heroes are, right? It used to be, for example, I don't know, Thomas Jefferson or, you know, some presidents, but now, you know, there are situations where statues are being torn down. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a whole different debate whether it's you know warranted or not, but uh, why are heroes so important to have, and who should our heroes be? Because society keeps changing, right? right? Our our view of historical figures. Obviously, slavery is horrible now, right? But three hundred years ago, it was commonplace. So, should we criticize a person for being? horrible in one aspect of their life but um really but but you know but bringing value to people um in other yeah. ways you know? no I, I hear you well slavery of course is horrible in any time not only 300 years ago but also 2000 years ago right. the stoics <laughs> lived in a time where you know the slavery was the was commonplace um but Definitely, in certain periods of, hum of human history, this was accepted as a as a kind of a default state, and uh, you know it's not particularly useful to go back, uh, let's say, two thousand years ago and say, "Oh, uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, was an emperor in Rome, and the, and and uh, Rome had slaves." Well, I know that every society at the time had slaves, uh, you know, including the the society from which the slaves can actually came from, because, you know, uh, for instance, uh, one of my favorite stories is. Um, uh, about Spartacus. Spartacus was a you know, well-known uh, slave in Rome who actually uh, was able to free himself and started a revolt uh, against, uh, you know, against the Romans. And today, Spartacus is portrayed as a freedom fighter, right? I mean, if you watch the movie, for instance, there are a couple of versions, movie ver cinematic versions of it. But he was not a freedom fighter. We know that he wanted to go back where he came from, trace it in trace in in uh, in, uh, in northern Greece, and have slaves. <laughs> so uh, you know, it's not. It wasn't. He wasn't fighting against slavery. He was fighting for for right. to free himself, which is a completely different thing. He wasn't questioning the uh the the institution of slavery he was just not wanting to be a slave himself well yes no no kidding um no now in terms of um so the the, the general notion of heroes uh, the stoics don't think in terms of heroes necessarily but as uh, uh, as in terms of role models and there is a difference there because heroes tend to be worshipped Right. They, they, in fact, the common phrase is hero worshiping. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, heroes are supposed to be perfect. And the problem with here with with uh, perfection is that this is not a human thing. Uh, no matter no matter how good or uninteresting or how you know 
important the person was, they, I guarantee you they were not perfect. Uh, right? You're going to find something wrong with them at some point or another. The more you're going to read about them, the more you're going to discover about them, at some point you're going to find something wrong. So the, the Stoics instead prefer to use role models. Role models are people who are generally speaking good. You know, they're doing the right things most of the times at least. And they kind of, uh, they inspire you, right? They are, they are, they are people that, that, uh, that inspire you, but it doesn't mean that they're perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you find out that they're flawed, you don't discard them as role models. You can just say, oh, well, <laughs> they were human after all, great. But they still did good things. And so uh, th the reason these Stoics thought that picking role models was important is because role models inspire us. And role models give us a, a uh, point of reference, mm -hmm. right? If I'm, I'm not as good as my role model, so I'm going to try to be better. I'm going to try to be in that direction, right? And role model, the choice of role models is very, is very personal. Uh, the Stoics didn't go out and say, you know, this, this guy should be a role model, that guy should be a role model. They gave examples, but, um, but actually Seneca himself, uh, in one of his uh, letters to his friend Lucilius, writes and says, you know, pick... Uh, somebody that fits with you, that, that it's you know, good for you as a, role, as a role model. Not everyone is going to be good for you. So for instance, in my case, I think of my grandfather as a role model. I grew up, grew up with him. Uh, he was one of the kindest and you know, most decent persons that I've ever met in my life. So he's a role model. Was he perfect? Of course not. Uh, he was a human being. Uh, you know, he had all sorts of uh, he had all sorts of ideas that were reflective of his time. Uh, you know, of the early part of the 20th century when he was growing up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But he was a very kind and a very decent person, and so he he's one of my role models. In terms of uh, public role models, like you know, a good one is Mel uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, why would that be? Was he perfect? Absolutely not. Again, he probably did. In fact, we know because we have biographies of him that he, you know, he made mistakes and, and he, he said things that we don't necessarily agree with. But this is a person who spent the majority of his life fighting for equality, fighting for, uh, you know, to demolish the apartheid uh, regime in, in uh, South Africa. He paid with, for that by, you know, spending plus, 20 plus years in prison. So this is a guy that is inspiring. It's an inspiring example. Um, so the notion of role models is personal. You have to pick one or two or three. You know that you don't necessarily need to pick one that work for you. But the important thing is that these are people you recognize that on the one hand they are inspiring because they're doing good things that you want to do yourself to, to do. You want to be like them in some general in, you know, respect. But at the same time, you realize that these are not perfect. These are not heroes. And so you don't just dump them into the dustbin as soon as you find out that there's something wrong with them. Yeah. Um, something I, I really want to get to in this conversation with you. Uh, you're, uh, I think you have your PhD in evolutionary biology, correct? So I want to touch on it a little bit just because uh, I feel like it's a very interesting topic of conversation. Um, so brief overview, you know, in the interest of time, I, I guess, right? So uh, what is evolutionary biology and uh, where do you see uh, evolutionary biology as a field? Well, that's, a, that's kind of a broad question. Um, yeah. Evolutionary biology is, a, in my mind, it's an interesting science because it is a, a complex combination of experimental and historical science. The sciences in general can be divided into these two broad categories, experimental and historical. Think of, you know, the quintessential experimental science, of course, is fundamental physics, right, where... Uh, the history of an electron or a photon doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where they've been in the universe and for how long they've been. They, you just, you can experiment them and you always get the same results over and over. The quintessential example of a historical science is paleontology, where you really cannot do experiments because literally everything you study is dead at this point. Uh, they're all fossils. Uh, but nevertheless, you, know, you can use met methods to uh, uncover the past to figure out what happened. Evolutionary biology is kind of in between because uh, it is a, a science that is concerned both with living organisms right now. So you can experiment. You know, when I was active as a biologist, I was working on 
uh, nature nurture uh, questions in plants. So I could collect a bunch of plants, put them in the laboratory conditions, do experiments with them, you know, grow them under different conditions and see what, what happens. So that's experimental. But at the same time, my results were clearly uh, affected by the history of those plants. If I use a different population or a different species of plants, I would get different results because they had a different evolutionary past. So one of the things I think it's interesting about evolutionary biology is that it is this really interesting hybrid between historical and, uh, and experimental sciences. Where is it now? Well, so evolutionary biology started out pretty much in 1858 with the publication of a joint paper by uh, Charles Darwin and, and, and uh, Russell um, Wallace in, uh, um, uh, in the Proceedings of the Linnean Society, I believe it was. That, that paper eventually was turned by uh, Darwin into The Origin of Species, the famous book that in 19, was published in, in 1859 and got the field started. Like any other science, science it itself, so to speak, evolved. Uh, there are different ideas that have been you know, put forth, different theories that the Darwinian theory has been expanded and made much more sophisticated. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, for instance, there was a lot of mathematical biologists who were interested in evolution and they put down the foundations for what is today called statistical genetics and, and computational genetics. Um, right now, we, uh, evolutionary biology is an interesting place because a lot of us, uh, uh, meaning myself and several of my colleagues, are pushing for yet another expansion of the theory. The theory has gone through a several periods of expansion, the original Darwinism, and then there was something called the uh, modern synthesis in the 1920s to the 1940s that kind of expanded the, the conceptual tools and the scope of evolutionary analysis. And now uh, a number of us are kind of pushing for a for further expansion. There is a lot of stuff that has been discovered uh, over the last 20 or 30 years that uh, doesn't necessarily fit the standard model as it was uh, in, in evolutionary biology, as it was uh, laid out in the beginning of the, part of the 20th century. So, so there is a lot of discussion. It's a very active field because there's a lot of discussions about where the theory is going. The fundamental ideas are still there. Nobody denies Darwin. Nobody denies natural selection as a major evolutionary process, et cetera, et cetera. But we do think that there are a lot of other evolutionary processes uh, besides natural selection that are taking place. Some of them are more difficult to describe. Some of them are more difficult to study, but they are out there. And so the field is very dynamic. If you look at the primary literature in evolutionary biology these days, uh, there's a lot of interesting you know, discussions among practitioners uh, of where the field is going. And I see kind of uh, you know, a bright future actually for evolutionary biology right now. The new tools that have been coming online, especially the molecular level you know, in terms of molecular biology have been very, very helpful to evolutionary biologists. We can do things today in terms of sequencing genomes, for instance, that we couldn't do like 10 years or 20 years ago even and uh, that have opened up a, a whole new vista in the entire field. Great. This sounds like a, maybe a future conversation that we can expand on. Uh, last question, I promise. Uh, I asked this of everyone. What are five books that you would recommend any subject to, to, uh, to the listeners and to everybody you meet? Uh, five books. Okay. Um, well, since we've been talking about stoicism, I would say, obviously, Epictetus' Discourses. Uh, that is a, um, I think it's a, it's a, it, it really is the kind of book that will change your life, that might change your life uh, if you uh, listen and sort of understand exactly what, uh, what Epictetus is telling you. So that's one. Um, a second book that has had a major impact in my life is Carl Sagan's The Demon Hunted World. Carl Sagan was an astronomer and a skeptic, and he wrote a lot about pseudoscience. And uh, The Demon Hunted World, even though it was published a number of years ago, is still today one of the best books on critical thinking and uh, on, on differentiating science from pseudoscience that you can uh, possibly read. So, I, And it's very accessible, uh, among other things. So, so I would say that. Uh, I would uh, also suggest Bertrand Russell, uh, Why I'm Not a Christian. And the reason for that is because the, uh, the book is by one of the foremost logicians and you know, most influential philosophers of the 20th century and a very good writer, you know, very you know, interesting sense of humor and all that sort of stuff. And it does go through 
uh, why it doesn't make a lot of sense to not only be a Christian in particular, but really be religious in, in general. Um, so it makes for a, a challenging reading, even if you are in fact a Christian, uh, you know, measuring yourself against Bentro Russell, it's, it's a good exercise, you know, it's like, so can, can you stand up to his arguments? Can you, can you actually uh, respond to his arguments? Uh, let's see, that gives us three books. Um, do I want to go into the fiction? Uh, yes, I probably do. Um, I would say, since I'm an uh, uh, aficionado of science fiction, I would say pretty much any book by um, Philip K. Dick. Uh, particularly, for instance, just to, to give you an example, uh, The Man in the High Castle. Um, it's probably one of his most uh, you know, better, better known. But Philip K. Dick was an in incredibly fascinating writer. Um, his science fiction is fairly dark. He has a fairly, fairly dark ver view of humanity, uh, you know, fairly pessimistic view of humanity. But he writes very well. Uh, it's the, his his uh, ideas are s fascinating. And he was philosophically informed. I mean, the guy actually spent a lot of time reading philosophy as well. And, and, he, and he, you, can, you can tell uh, from his books. I don't necessarily recommend the movies that have been made on the basis of his books, because the movies just as as it's typical in Hollywood, they, they just go in directions that are much more simplistic compared to the books. So read the books instead of, or at least on top of watching the movies. Okay, so now we are at four. Um, I would say the fifth thing that probably a lot of your readers have, uh, your, your listeners have not read um, is one of the classics of all time. And that is The Odyssey by Homer. Uh, it's a fascinating book. It's one of the classic of Western literature, of course. Um, but the reason it's fascinating is because, by the way, we were talking about role models earlier on, and Odysseus was a, one of the role models of the Stoics. Uh, why was a role model? Because he was uh, courageous. He was very smart. He was intelligent. He, he applied reason to solve to resolve his problems. But most importantly, because he was trying to do the right thing. Despite all the obstacles that are thrown his way by the god um, Poseidon, who is pissed off at Odysseus, and so that's why it takes ten years to get back from the from the Trojan War, uh, he insisted he wanted to get back home because he wanted to get uh, to back to his wife and to his uh, to his son, and so he even turns down the gift of immortality twice in the Odyssey in order because he wants to go to, to go back. So so it's a really interesting. Uh, a book about human courage and endeavor and uh, and uh, what a single person can do uh, if it is determined enough. So those are the five, my five suggestions. Great. Uh, Massimo Piliucci, thank you very much for joining me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.